Hey there you guys, welcome back. Today I thought we'd do something a little bit different. Uh, I was wondering what I would uh, film about today and uh, I was looking outside at my Crocosmia and I've been wanting to do a video on Crocosmia for a little while uh, but I don't know very much about it. It's uh, new to my garden. It's been here for, this is the third year I believe. I think I planted it late in the season uh, three years ago. Uh, so uh, this is its third season, uh, growing second season actual full seasons. Uh, so I've just, I don't know, it's one of those plants that uh, flew under the radar for me and uh, I bought it uh, recently because uh, I've been trying to bring hummingbirds to the garden and I heard that Crocosmia was really, really good for that because of the beautiful trumpet shaped flowers. Uh, so that's the reason why I bought it. In the garden center, it doesn't really look great. It kind of looks like a gladiola, but it never seems to be in a beautiful, uh, uh, in, in beautiful bloom when I see it at the garden center, so you don't really get to appreciate it. Uh, so I finally bought one and uh, I love it. I've moved it once. It was a little further down in this garden. I might have to move it again because now it's under this tree, uh, so it gets a little bit more shade than maybe it wants. So I thought we'd do a little bit uh, a different video today, a little bit of a different structure, and uh, we'll learn about it together. I've got my tablet here, uh, so we're going to uh, check it out on here. I will show photos if there's photos available, um, especially with uh, different varieties of the Crocosmia. Uh, so let's just get into it. Let's, uh, let's see what this thing likes. So Crocosmia is, uh, is native to Africa, and I believe there's one species that's endemic to, uh, to Madagascar. Uh, so that was really, really interesting. These plants grow well in full sun or part shade. Uh, in a cooler climate like myself, it probably wants to be in full sun. Uh, you get best flowering when it's in full sun. God, those flowers are beautiful. Uh, and I uh, get sidetracked. <laughs> uh, but if you're in a really hot climate, you might want to uh, plant it in a part shade location. Uh, but just keep in mind that uh, lots of sun gives you better flowers. This plant is hardy to zone, uh, I guess most of the varieties are hardy to zone 6 to 9, but there's a variety called Lucifer, and I believe it's got a, a really, really deep red flower. I don't believe this one's Lucifer, I can't remember, uh, but I don't believe it is. I was looking for Lucifer, but I couldn't find it. Uh, but that one is hardy to zone 5 to 9, however, there are some sources that were saying four to nine. So if you're in a, a colder climate, you might want to give it a try. If you are on the colder end of that and you don't want to uh, risk it, you can dig them up like you would a gladiola and store them over the winter time. Uh, these corms or bulbs are going to uh, be really sensitive to heat. So you might not see them grow until the soil temperature actually increases. I don't know what the, the amount was, uh, what the actual temperature where they start to grow is but uh, uh, they might take a little while. They might start growing in June uh, if, if your soil is particularly cold. Uh, so just uh, hang tight and uh, give it a wait. Be patient because these are worth the wait. So these uh, plants, they grow between three and four feet tall. Uh, this one here, I'm gonna say is close to three feet tall, especially the ones in the back. Uh, I'd like it to see maybe four feet tall, uh, but uh, I like the way that it is right now. I, I like the way that it's leaning out from the tree and I like that the flowers are cascading over the garden. I don't think that you can see it here, but if you watch my, my, uh, my video, uh, my backyard tour video, uh, you'll see that uh, they do hang down. Actually, they're hanging down over the Japanese maple over to the side. I'll, I'll do some B-roll as well when I'm talking and uh, hopefully you'll be able to see that. Uh, I think I might have uh, picked that up in the shot. So the flowers start to appear in either May or June. Uh, so they are fairly early to start their flowering. Uh, so this one here, it started to produce its flower spikes in June, um, but then it didn't actually start flowering until July. Um, and they say that if you cut back the flower spikes to the, to the closest leaf, uh, that you could possibly see uh, more flower development. I don't see how that's possible, but uh, Supposedly they also make uh, wonderful cut flowers, but I'm just going to leave them in place because I'm trying to uh, track the hummingbirds. So as much as I'd like to see them in a bouquet in on the uh, uh, the, the kitchen counter or wherever I would put a, a vase of flowers, I, I think I'd prefer to keep them out here for the, uh, for the hummingbirds. And if you're asking if these are fragrant, 
I don't notice any fragrance on these, but uh, there is supposed to be something if you dry the flowers and then rehydrate the flowers, they smell like saffron. I, I don't, I don't uh, smell anything, so uh, <laughs> maybe it's just an evening or a, a more, I'm, I'm in the morning and I don't smell anything. So not so much on the, the fragrance department, but uh, I don't care, they're so beautiful. And it's not necessary to prune the uh, crocosmia, it seems, uh, after it's finished flowering. Uh, you can let the seeds produce and then and then let them try to self-seed. I'm going to try that with one or two of my stalks, but I'm going to cut back some of them because it also uh, says in the, uh, the literature that uh, uh, if you cut them back, it sends the energy to the bulbs or the corms, uh, which is uh, a known uh, fact for most plants. Uh, it's not wasting the energy on producing the seeds. Uh, it's going to be uh, uh, sizing up its bulb or corm. Uh, and maybe producing more offsets, so you're going to get a better show uh, regardless. So it depends on if you want to try to grow them from seed. I, again, I'm going to save a few. Uh, I'm going to scatter them around the base of the plant, and uh, maybe I'll put some in pots. I'm not sure. I'll probably just scatter them around the plant. I don't have uh, a lot of space for more pots in the house or even outside. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. I like to do that with my species tulips. I like to uh, uh, let some of the seed heads uh, harden off and or um, dry out, and then I, I scatter the seeds around the plant so that I don't weed them out thinking they're grass. Uh, I think I mentioned that these are in the iris family. I should have started with that, uh, and they're related to the, uh, to the uh, gladiolas, which makes sense because when you look at the leaves on these, they say gladiola, uh, but uh, the flowers absolutely do not. And the buds of these plants, uh, they looked like um heliconia to me uh they were really really cool they had a lot of color they had a lot of uh drama excitement to them and when i came outside i just couldn't stop staring it's one of those things that you have to look up close to and uh they're absolutely stunning uh so yeah there's that <laughs> as the uh the clump gets a little bit bigger uh, maybe after three or four years of growing it. I don't know. I would probably wait a little longer than that because it, this is this is uh, two and a half to three years of growth. I'd like to see it get a little bit bigger before you disturb it. Uh, and it takes a little bit for the plant to uh, uh, acclimate to its spot. Um, it, they recommend dividing it. You'll notice if you let the clump stay uh, a clump for a long time, uh, flower production slows down. You're not going to get as good of a show. Uh, they'll start to kind of crowd each other out, so it's best to divide them in uh, in uh, late summer, early fall, and uh, transplant them where you want them. Uh, so that will rejuvenate the plant and uh, hopefully give you a nicer uh, show the following year. From what I'm, I'm reading, there is a possibility that some varieties of these might become a little invasive. Uh, so just uh, be mindful of, of where you're planting these. Uh, wetlands and and uh, what does it say here uh, riverbanks wetlands along uh, roadsides and uh, shrublands they can become invasive so that might be another reason why uh, people cut them back the, the flower spikes back so that they don't seed um, but just be wary of that uh, in your climate just in case they they are invasive I'll let you know how this one grows uh, it does also say that they're easily removed uh, so uh, so that's good but when they self-seed everywhere and the uh, the leaves kind of look like a, a, a gladiola or like a, a thick grass, uh, it might not be easy to uh, to see in a field environment. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, let's get to uh, the different varieties of these. The majority of them are in the red tones, but there are oranges and there is also a yellow variety that I've seen. Uh, so let's uh, let's look at some of the um, the things. I'll put photos up of these varieties. Okay, so I finally brought up some varieties here. These are the best varieties uh, from gardening.net uh, for your garden. Uh, so the first one here is called uh, Crocosmia lucifer. Um, it's the most popular variety of, uh, or cultivar of, uh, of uh, Crocosmia. And this one, when I look at the photos, this one might be lucifer. I don't think that the tag said lucifer because I know that I wanted it, but I don't think that that's what I got, but I, I can't remember. Um, but they look very, very similar. I will buy a Lucifer again, uh, just in case, and see if there's any difference between the two. So Lucifer is quite popular. Uh, again, the photos will be up there on what I'm looking at. There's another one, Crocosmia masoniorum. Uh, it's a robust Crocosmia. It's very attractive, an elegant species. 
with brilliant upward facing uh, flaming orange blooms uh, setting atop arching stems blooming from midsummer to early fall and that is beautiful it looks like an orange variety and then we've got uh, Carmen Brilliant and that looks like it's uh, an orange with um, with a yellow center and uh, it looks like the flowers are more open uh, than the uh, the typical trumpet shape that I'm used to that's pretty cool and then there's an Emily McKenzie that one's quite lovely as well these remind me a lot of uh, freesias. Well, the, the one that I have reminds me of a freesia. There's honey angels. Oh, that one's a pretty one. That one is a nice yellow variety. These look like they're a little bit more of a bell shape. Let's see what it says here. A prolific and compact uh, crocosmia. Honey angels features sprays of small trumpet shaped flowers, uh, yellow flowers with charming honey tones and creamy throats. Uh, they bloom from late summer through early fall uh, and rise with majesty above handsome clumps. And uh, that is lovely. I love the yellow. Maybe I'll have to get some yellow. I need some orange for the garden and maybe some yellow. What is this one? Sulfater. I hope I'm saying that right. It's another yellow variety. It looks like the uh, the flowers, the they might be held um, a little bit taller, kind of like a, uh, a gladiola and yeah very very interesting you'll see what i mean by the flower and they are uh they feature attractive sprays of soft apricot yellow flowers floating atop nicely contrasting foliage atop uh, sword shaped uh, bronze green leaves blooming from late summer to early fall so these most of these plants are late summer to early fall flowers and that's amazing star of the east is another variety this one is a lovely orange variety that uh, kind of radiates to a, a, a red tone love that uh, and that's all for the varieties I'm sure there's a lot more but these are just popular varieties for the garden I don't think that I touched on the soil I don't know that soil is super super important for these guys but they want to have a moist well-drained soil uh, because they're a bulb uh, they they don't want to be sitting in water uh, so if you have a um, an area that holds a little bit uh, more moisture, maybe raise it up in the bed a little bit. Uh, they don't really want to stay dry for extended periods. Um, that being said, I did see some growing in, uh, what do they call them? The Boulevard Garden, uh, where it doesn't get a lot of water and it's really, here it's, it's really terrible soil, really bad clay, and it was so dry. Uh, the plant, it didn't, it was growing but it didn't look beautiful. Uh, this one here is in moist, free-draining soil. There is clay soil under here, but I've amended the soil. Uh, so this does drain. This is the higher part of the garden, and it's growing amazingly here. Um, but uh, it does seem to grow in, in drier soils, but you'll probably need to water them regularly. Uh, they, uh, they don't look their best, in my opinion, uh, when, they're, when they're allowed to, to stay too dry. Uh, but also, if they stay too wet, you run the possibility of the uh, the bulb or corm uh, rotting out. So uh, just keep that in mind. And uh, why did I end my video on that? <laughs> anyway, uh, let me know what variety is your favorite of Crocosmia, if you're even growing Crocosmia. And uh, I'd love to know, and what other plants should I maybe uh, look into and, and maybe do an episode on? Uh, this is the first of this format. I'm sure I'll get better. Maybe I'll have a uh, specific... Uh, laid out uh, uh, format for uh, for soil types and uh, varieties and, and uh, uh, families and all that stuff. Uh, but uh, this is the very first, and I didn't know what I was going to do. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> hope you tolerated. Hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, you guys, happy growing.